My talk is called Me Too and You, Sexual Assault and the Power of Storytelling. Sexual assault is the most ubiquitous, most misunderstood, and prior to this year, most invisible felony in our society. As a survivor I am close with once told me, given our society's sexual assault statistics are one in three for women, either everyone here is either a survivor, related to or close friends with one, or related to and close friends with one and doesn't know it and may never. As another friend said to me once, and it stuck, if our society was fully transparent in acknowledging assault and compassionate in its response to it, the world as we know it would be entirely unrecognizable. In 2006, I read an article in an online journal. It spoke about a handful of women who were each the victims of a crime while serving in our military. What was so surprising was not the brutality of the assaults themselves, but the fact that none of these women had recourse to an impartial system of justice. I called up the reporter and asked if the story had been picked up and gone wider. She said, much to her surprise, it had not. No one, she said, wanted to hear about it. No one was very interested. So Director Kirby Dick and I started doing our own investigations and uncovered that every day in our US military, according to DOD estimates, 49 women and men are sexually assaulted, not overseas, not in the line of combat, not by the enemy, but right here on American soil, in the line of duty by their fellow soldiers. And when women would step up in good faith to report these crimes, they more often than not were disbelieved, themselves blamed, encouraged to stay silent so that the institution and its commanders could maintain an unblemished facade. And so they would attempt to bury their pain and confusedly return to work beside their assailants, often suffering recurring attacks until they, more often than not, would implode, not from the violence of the assaults themselves, but from the violence of the silence imposed on them, from their inability to speak and share, to be heard by their peers and community. After a good year plus of being unable to receive any funding for this film, we were told time and again that no one cared about women's stories. This is 2006. No one cared about rape stories, and really no one cared about women being raped in the military. The director and I ran, just took a camera and went around the country talking to survivors. Their stories were harrowing and heartbreaking, each one uncannily echoing the others, even though each of these women had all served in different branches and during different decades in our military. I remember leaving the house of a woman in upstate New York, Teresa, now 40, who had entered the army when she was 19. After telling me her story as I was leaving, she said, Amy, even if you don't end up making this documentary, or even if you end up making it and I'm not in it, Thank you so much for coming to talk to me today because you're the first person who ever believed me, who ever cared to listen. The film premiered at Sundance and it, and it swept the festival like a tsunami. I, I laugh because I remember walking into the first screening and a one publicist yelled to the other, good luck with that rape film. And it ended up prompting five congressional hearings, the penning and passing of 35 pieces of legislation, and changing military policy thanks to Secretary of Defense, then Lee. Yeah. It's not, but all this, remember, all this was because a handful of women elected to speak up, not for self-aggrandizement or acclaim, but simply in the hopes of preventing another person from being harmed. So we finished Invisible War and we started a campaign, you know, obviously to raise these reforms and we showed the film on campuses around the country. And what was so crazy about that was every time we showed the film on a campus, someone would come up to us and say, you know, this happened to me here. This happened to me at Bowdoin. This happened to me at Harvard. This happened to me at UCSB. You don't need to go to the military for this. And we started then getting letters in our inboxes. Dear Ms. Ziering, dear Mr. Dick, will you please make a film about what's going on on our campuses? So we stopped, but we were working on an entirely different project. We called our distributor and we pivoted and we started making a film about assault on our campuses, which ended up The Hunting Ground, which you just saw the clip from, which is a wrenching expose about the epidemic of rape on our campuses. And it also chronicled and captured in real time the student movement, 
that had arisen to call it out and attempt to stem its proliferation. The combination of the courageous voices speaking up in the invisible war and the hunting ground and decades of work by students, activists, and ag ac advocates, which then led to give the New York Times and the New Yorker feel have the courage and license to finally publish stories about crimes we'd heard about for years by Harvey Weinstein and others in the entertainment industry, has led to the beginnings of a profound cultural shift that we all are now so fortunate to be witnessing. For the first time in our lifetimes, the blame for rapes in our culture is being placed on perpetrators and not victims. What's so interesting to me about the genesis and genealogy of this narrative, that a small story in an online journal led to an expose by a team of filmmakers, which in turn led to a second expose because people having watched the first, is that it spoke, powerfully speaks to what you all are doing here at BlogHer. You are here because you know that women's stories matter and that it is our obligation, our duty, and our responsibility to tell them and to listen, even when listening is painful and unpleasant, and to speak up, even when that speaking up requires courage, even when it would be easier to turn away and elect to remain silent. I'm in a small home in Berkeley getting ready to film an interview for The Hunting Ground. A young girl, barely a sophomore, is carrying her with her her childhood teddy bear. She holds the bear in her lap and our interview begins. Towards the end of our talk, I ask her, what was it like when you told your parents? She tells me she's never told them. When I ask her why, she says she didn't want to make them sad or for them to look at her differently, but had decided to speak with me so that maybe she could make other girls who like her or out there feel better if they're hiding in plain sight. I start to cry and she sees that I'm sad, and she asks if I want to keep her bare. We are each other's stories. We have a responsibility to share them if we can. Even if it takes courage, even if it makes us sad, maybe even most especially if it does. Thank you. Thank you.